information overload, it's becoming increasingly more important to communicate clearly and concisely so you're able to punch through the noise and connect with your audience in a meaningful way. This can be especially challenging for highly technical professionals who are having to grapple with very, very complex topics and issues. Yet doing this effectively is so important to addressing critical business issues and more broadly, world issues. Take climate change, for instance, and the Carbon Almanac. The Carbon Almanac, which has one very simple, hopeful core message, it's not too late. And it's intended to connect people around the world with the issues in digestible terms through the use of infographics, analogies, stories, and more. And it provides insightful actions versus overly complicated statistics. Now, this session will not teach you how to produce a complete almanac. It will, however, offer a wealth of advice and suggestions for leveling up your technical communication. And joining us today, we have three distinguished panelists who are experts in this area. I have the honor of introducing to you Sarah Poland. Sarah is the Chief Technology Officer for HashiCorp. And in her role as CTO, Sarah is responsible for advising customers on complex multi-cloud digital transformations. And Sarah, just in looking at your posts on LinkedIn, it's evident to me that you have mastered the ability to communicate really complex concepts in a way that's relatable and uh, resonates with those that maybe aren't familiar with those terms. And the one I'm thinking of is your recent post where you likened a botched cloud migration to a really congested uh, intersection in a city. And I don't know a lot about cloud migrations, but it was obvious to me through that metaphor and the associated image that it, uh, botching it can lead to a lot of bottlenecks, reduced speed, and a whole lot of risk. So thank you. Thank you for making that accessible. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, I think one thing that becomes hypercritical, especially once we move into technology and all of these digital transformations, there's so many different niches within the market currently that it, you can't rest on the laurels that everybody understands what you're talking about because things have become so broad. There's so many different types of technology, technologies evolving in different fields in different ways. So it's really important to be very clear about what you're trying to achieve and what you want to achieve when you want to do that. I think for me, coming from a non-traditional background, um, I was an opera singer before I was ever in technology, has really helped me to understand where is that bottom line and that just because I speak one language, that doesn't mean that the rest of my audience also speaks that language. And it doesn't mean that I have the same goals as one of my peers does, for example. So even within the field CTO organization, one of my closest peers tends to focus much more on just global cost, whereas I tend to focus more on security. And that's just how we've evolved over the space of our careers. So finding a common ground where we can really communicate and understand and then help roll that forward to customers to help them with these digital transformations becomes really key. Absolutely. Yeah, I like that point about finding that common ground. And um, the theme throughout what you were saying is the importance of being really audience centric and tailoring your message to the people that you're communicating with. So look forward to getting lots of sage advice from you. 
Also joining us today is Emilio Reyes LeBlanc. And Emilio is a technology specialist at Microsoft. In his role, he supports technical and business teams by creating clarity and urgency around complex topics. And Emilio, one of the many things I admire about you is you clearly have this belief that communicating effectively is a skill that you can never work on perfecting enough. Uh, you are an exceptional presenter. I've seen you in action. Despite that fact, it's clear that you continue to work on fine-tuning your craft. And that was evidenced recently through the uh, the Rising Star Award that you received from the Microsoft Speakers Bureau. So I have a feeling that you have quite a bit of advice to share with our audience today. Yeah, this is a topic that means a lot to me, Carrie, and I'm pleased to be here with the team today. You know, I think something that created that sense of urgency of improving this skill was realizing earlier in my career as a technology operator that the best idea doesn't always win in the boardroom. And to that end, I've seen people with masterful communication skills move quicker and get more meaningful work done for their clients and for the businesses that they represent. Those are skills that I've honed over the past five years. And to your point about getting trained, I very much believe in the idea of continued education on this front. And so kudos to all of you today who are investing your time in learning from us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Emilio. Uh, and last but not least, we have John Warren. John is one of Power Speaking's master facilitators and coaches, and he has the distinguished honor of being Power Speaking's very first contract facilitator, which means, John, that you have over three decades three decades of experience coaching highly technical professionals all around the world, um, to your point, Sarah, in all kinds of different expertise and levels in helping them translate their message in a way that really connects with the audience and inspires the right action. Thank you for that, Carrie. It, it actually is one of my greatest joys to work with people who are brilliant in their fields to give them the skills they need to communicate that brilliance in a way that the audience ultimately benefits. Because uh, for me to show off how smart I am doesn't serve anybody. To help the audience become smarter is something that brings me great joy, and I love doing this work. <laughs> it shows. It shows. All right. Let's get into it. Uh, I established at the outset how critical it is for scientists all kinds of technical experts to be able to communicate concisely and clearly. So let's start with each of you sharing an example of an expert or an organization who you think does this particularly well. And let's lead off with you, John. Great. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I was a math major in college, and I remember to this day on day one of advanced calculus when our professor asked, can anybody define a function? On the first day of a new class, I like to look good, so a lot of hands went up. And he called in my buddy, Ed Jennings, who said, a function is a one-to-one -one mapping from, of elements from the domain into the range. Professor says, perfect textbook definition. Could anybody now describe that to a 10-year-old? And not a hand in the room went up. And he told us the most profound thing I remember from advanced calculus. He said, if you can't describe what you're doing to a 10-year-old, you may be able to do the calculus, you don't yet really understand the calculus. So then he says, let me give you my definition. Now this man has a PhD in pure mathematics. He said a function is simply a box. You drop one number in the top, turn the crank, a different number pops out of the bottom. He made it so simple to visualize and understand. I have never forgotten that. Oh, that's a wonderful, wonderful example. Thank you. How about you, Emilio? Yeah, I'm going to give an example of a well-known CEO of a technology company named Bill McDermott, who runs ServiceNow. Bill has a very storied career working across a variety of large technology companies, <clears throat> including SAP. And something that makes Bill really special is that he's, in many ways, a non-technical person. 
But what he does is he gets technical people excited to partner with their company. And the way that he does that is by focusing on very simple messaging on the value proposition of working with, in this case, ServiceNow. So if you take a look at some of his keynote speeches, he talks a lot about this theme of work being this arduous thing. Work is hard. And a lot of times when we're at work, we're not actually working. We're doing things except working. We're working with opening email, sending email, sending email to another person, writing a message, categorizing something from column A to column B. And what he does is he really seizes on this tension that all of us can relate to when he's talking about service now and the idea that we want to make work work better for people. We want people to spend less time on the busy work and more time on the meaningful work. And although the product that he sells and represents is relatively complex, he does a good job at continually up-leveling the conversation to a pain point that we can all relate to regardless of our technical level. An engineer experiences in these issues in the same way that a CEO does. And by unifying that messaging, he also helps us understand that it's not necessarily the presentation skill that differentiates the clear communication. It's the idea. And I think something that I'm going to be talking about today is it not the idea that presentation skills themselves separate a good executive communicator, but it's the idea. And the best ideas communicated succinctly and clearly when with a sense of passion and urgency always drive action. Mm. Oh, wow. Very, very, very well said. I like how you're talking about uh, communication skills alone obviously isn't going to achieve that result. It's having that very original idea and be able to convey it in a way that's relatable with passion. If you don't seem to care about your topic, other people certainly aren't. Uh, and we're getting a lot of positive response from from our audience. Uh, Sarah, how about you? So interestingly enough, I all three of us seem to be quite aligned in terms of what seems to hook us and, and presenters. Um, for me, it's Wired's five stages of explanation. Um, they have a program, and you should get the link for this, um, where they explained a complex theory to five different levels. And it starts from a five-year-old and goes all the way up through a PhD student. And what they do so well with this is make that point very clear on various different levels and give you a way to really hook in. So you have that value in what you're trying to understand. Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. oh, sorry. You have that core sort of understanding. But then it also gives you the leveling and gives you an idea of how you might want to structure that. If you're giving a keynote or if you're in front of a panel of experts, your messaging is going to be a little bit different. But again, that key or that core message is going to be the same. Oh, wow. And that's called Wired? It's from Wired. Yeah, it's uh -huh. five, five levels of expertise, I think is what it is, or five levels. Of okay. Expertise. Terrific. What a great resource. And um way to get a lot of examples on how to do this effectively as to your point on different levels and we've got the link in chat for those of you who are, who are interested in learning more so let's talk about some of the mistakes what are common mistakes that technical experts make and what's your advice for uh, not necessarily overcoming them but what kind of impacts can that have on their career their business etc Emilio? Yeah, I've got some ideas around this, Carrie. So I think the key mistake that I see everyone making from small companies to large companies to technology companies to financial services companies is having too much content for the presentation time. So in the technical world, many of us are focusing on projects that take months and years to complete. So to the presenter who needs to share the results of a machine learning experiment, or for instance, progress toward a roadmap for an implementation of a technology, there are a lot of things that somebody has and can communicate. However, I think something that has helped me structure the way of presenting and choosing the appropriate scope for a presentation is to use something that I learned in power speaking, which is this 30-10 rule. So the idea is if you have 30 minutes of time, to communicate and discuss a technical topic, only 10 minutes should be reserved 
to the content itself. Well, what about the remaining 20 minutes? Well, those are time, that's time that you want to invest in facilitating a conversation around the topic. When we're communicating progress, we're not doing it to give somebody an update on its own, right? We're generally doing it to drive action, to make a request, to maybe make an estimate for when the project will be completed, to get feedback on how to complete the project quicker. So something that technical presenters can do to overcome that mistake of having too much content is really trimming and thinking about the scope of what to discuss. Now, again, one of the hard things to do about that, especially in my world where I'm working with issues around telephony and database, sometimes internet of things, very complex topics, is to really cut down the topic material to something that, first of all, the audience can give an opinion on or give feedback on. And secondly, something that I do is really try to isolate the content to something that people need to, information on to make a decision. So for example, if you're talking about a big contact center migration, you might have a question about whether the AI project is going to be first phase or second phase. Well, if that's really the core of what you need to get out of a discussion, that's the thing that you should bring up at the very beginning rather than progress that you've made toward a certain end. Mm -hmm. So again, one of the key technical mistakes that people make is having too much content. And one of the ways to really trim that down that I've seen is by really thinking about what decisions need to be made in that meeting. Now, as far as what impact can it make to have this sort of mistake in the way that you present, there are all sorts of ways that making this error can impact your career. So I'll never forget the time that I was in a boardroom at one really large media company very early on in my technical sales experience where somebody from the legal team asked a question about security. And so there I am answering everything that I know to do with the security around this particular technology. And in the back of the room, an account executive is going like this to me. And the reason he's saying that is because, not because what I was saying wasn't true or that we wanted to deceive the customer in any way, but it just wasn't the right time to be bringing up an entirely new topic of discussion when we had very limited amount of time. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of ways to manage that sort of objection. But again, this all comes back to the key theme of technical people really needing to scope and refine their talk track to only talk about the things that require a decision in that moment. So that's really my opinion and my story for how choosing an appropriate scope has impacted my career and my clients. Oh, wow. Thank you for sharing that. That is an excellent, excellent advice and also... Uh, story of how it can easily go wrong if you don't not only prepare the um, key information you need to provide to reach that decision like you have, which can always thinking with the end in mind, what is the goal that I'm trying to achieve? What is the decision I'm trying to facilitate here? And what information is essential to achieving that goal? And that helps to separate the must-haves from the nice-to-haves. But also to your point, Emilio, um, really thinking through what might happen in the moment. What questions and objections might you get? And how are you going to effectively respond to those ways that's suitable for the amount of time you have? And again, back to the goal or decision. Uh, just briefly, uh, knowing what you know now, how would you have responded differently? Uh, thanks for this question. Um... I would have tried to figure out the question behind the question. So in my head, before I said anything, I would be wondering, is this person asking this question because they're nervous that we may not meet the requirements? Or are they asking this question because they're ready to buy? And I think in this particular case, what I would probably do to this person is I would say, you know, I understand you have some sort of some questions around security. Is that because you're considering us the final round of consideration? I might ask that first. That's one way to do it. Mm. Another thing that I might say is, are you concerned that we might not meet the requirements to push this across the line? And another thing that I might say is, are you concerned that this wasn't a part of the agenda? If that's so, is this something that we can shell for a future time? So there are all sorts of ways that I would want to read the room about managing that objection, but something in the first two responses that you saw that I'm trying to do is probably allude to the fact that this person is excited enough to bring us to the final, final frontier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, 
that's great because then they're able to give me information on what we need to address before we bring things further. Because in our world as technical people, we're, you know, we're used to requirements gathering from users, but we're not so much used to gathering information as requirements to say, push a business decision across the line. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, I see that as a gift when somebody gives me an objection in that sort of way, because it's an opportunity for us to get more information to be more helpful to make that technical decision to the customer. That was such, such a great way to position it is, is viewing it as a gift to get even more information. And John, I know you can relate to this, uh, given the, the workshops that you teach, which, um, covers the skill that Emilio is talking about, which takes some practice in getting to the question behind the question. And it also takes courage. And often what we hear from participants in our workshop is, well, it, what if I get it wrong? Like Emilio, you said, um, are you asking because we're in the final consideration for the, the, the buy or whatever your words were? Not a problem if you get it wrong. If you get it wrong, they're going to clarify for you. And tell you what's really going on in their mind, which will enable you to provide a response that will hopefully mitigate some of that that concern. So very excellent. Was there anything, John or Sarah, you wanted to add? No, I think th I really like the, the idea of 30 minutes versus 10. I think another place where we really get it wrong as technologists is assuming that we're all operating from the same vocabulary and the same understanding. Mm -hmm. And that's something that whether it's because I come from a, a different background or I'm a woman, I don't know. But I think the first several years of my career, I sat in the back kind of in fear that I didn't understand what was going on. I'd be sitting in these technical discussions or keynotes and thinking that I was the only person in the room who was completely lost and didn't understand what they were talking about or where they were coming from or where they were going. And it took me quite a while to understand that well, no, there's just no baseline in place. And whoever was speaking or the conversation was operating from this point of view that everybody had the same background, everybody had the same understanding. And even something as simple as an application. Well, if you go to an infrastructure team and you say, hey, what's your application? They're going to be talking about the containerization underneath it. They're going to be talking about what actually runs the business logic. Whereas if you go to an application developer and you say, hey, where's your application? They're going to be talking about the actual business logic behind it. So they're both very viable definitions for application, and they're both commonly used across the industry. But that's going to alter depending on who your audience is and who's in the room. So making sure that you set that baseline from the very beginning to be sure that everyone is on the same page is also very critical. And that will set you up in a place where you have that 10 minutes and you can use that 10 minutes as well as humanly possible so that you really can drive that impact and really move the business conversation forward. Right. Great. Um, so Sarah, can you talk more about, uh, cause doing that effectively, um, starting with that baseline, that's going to resonate with everybody in your audience, uh, suggests you have an understanding of who is in your audience and their frame of reference. So can you talk a little bit more, um, any advice you have for how to effectively do that audience analysis? Yeah, it again, it depends on the context. For me, if I'm walking into a meeting where I have a bunch of stakeholders, I do research on my stakeholders. I know who is sitting at my table. I know how long they've been in the industry. What is their background? Where are they coming from? sometimes even more personal conversations because that's going to help me drive a conversation and understand how that flow of conversation may go. And that also will help me understand where is that baseline and where is that baseline sitting and do we actually speak the same language? If we don't speak the same language, I need to spend that initial part of that meeting or that session really just making sure that we're all on the same page and that we all understand things from the same point of view. Whether or not we agree on that, that's a different story, but understanding where that's coming from. If I'm at a larger conference, it's going to be driven around who are the other speakers at the conference, um, who else will be presenting also in front of me and behind me. Um, yeah, what else? Why, why is the conference there? If it's an application conference and a developer conference, that's a very different conversation than a CISO conference where we're going to be talking about security and risk as opposed to how do we make things faster and how do we innovate 
So all of those things, I think the research is critical and it's probably something we don't do enough of um, as, yeah, well, on the vendor side for sure. Um, but I think even internally, whether you're within a financial services institution, just knowing who you're talking to is really going to help you facilitate those conversations. Absolutely. Absolutely. What would you add, Emilio? Uh, yeah, I'll give I'll give a couple a different perspective. I try to identify where people are hungry to change in their own careers. So I work with enterprise customers. That typically means I work with really large groups of people. And I'm always looking at people's LinkedIn's and also trying to make rapport to understand who sees themselves as a change maker, who's bored in their job, who can I help get promoted? And when you figure out that level of individual drive, that's where you can align with these people and help them be absolutely gravitational to sort of an idea getting adopted. So I'll give an example. I'm working with a customer right now, an extremely large customer, Fortune 5 company, and there's a new executive vice president there. This person has had a career that is absolutely soared. And this person comes in and they want their reputation, I'm imagining, to be somebody that changes the pathway of this company. Well, that's a person I want to align to. That's the person I want to share all of my excitement with. And what I really think about in doing customer research is it's not so much a function of what is their position and what does that position care about. That's a pretty vanilla way in my way, in my approach of, of doing customer research. Because, for instance, you might meet a CIO who thinks of herself as somebody who's really driving innovation and not just ensuring things like data integrity and security and so on. Likewise, you might find somebody on the sales team who fancies themselves a tech visionary. So the notion of taking someone's job title and presuming that you know what they care about is a very alpha level sophistication of doing research. What I advise people to do is to think about people's career trajectory. If they're stunted, if they're rising stars, if they're hungry, if they want to be change makers and pivoting your attention to those people to help you drive change in the organization. I really love that idea. The The change maker, I think, is a, a huge catalyst. I love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I, at the heart of what you're saying, Emilio, is not just understanding what is it that they want and need to know, what motivates them. And, you know, the, the simple that we've heard years and years and years, the with them, what's in it for me. Excellent. Mary's saying, I love that career tra trajectory concept. Uh, David Binder, really like that filtering question. What decisions need to be made in this meeting and let you connect? And, and let your content be driven by the answer. Excellent. So, so great. Uh, we've got loads of nuggets here. John, what would you have to add on this topic? Well, both Sarah and Emilio have put their finger on something that <clears throat> is the first thing we teach in every one of our classes at Power Speaking. Before I start thinking about what content I want to cover, what does this particular audience need to hear? What is happening in their world so that my content can be helpful to them and relevant to their needs. And one of the things that, that uh, Brian's gonna put in the chat is a document that we use in our high-tech speaking class so that I don't have to remember what the checklist looks like. It's something that any one of our participants today can, can take a look at so that I'm not starting from scratch. If it's an all technical audience at a very high level, that's a very different talk that if it's a mixed technical audience, some experts and some novices. So there's another document in the chat. If you have mixed technical audience, we recommend you start at a high level first, give people an overview. And if you have managers in there, what's the business implication of this? And then you start diving deeper into the technology and save the deep, deep dive until the end for those who really want to know how, do, how does it really work? What are the nuts and bolts? And that model serves a technical speaker really well because a lot of them want to go to the deep dive immediately, and there's a small percentage of a mixed audience that is ready to do that kind of dive. A good metaphor that, start snorkeling, not scuba diving. Save the <laughs> scuba diving for a later event. 
Thank you, John. That <laughs> drives the point home and is very, very memorable. Uh, Sarah, I saw a lot of head nods. It, it, I think, goes back to the point you made about the importance of making sure you start with that that common ground. Mm. It's one that everyone in the audience can relate to. So uh, awesome advice. Let's also, in addition to the importance of that audience analysis that can be very nuanced, as you described, Emilio, uh, Let's talk about another thing that's critically important for technical presenters that is often missed, and and that is not just focusing on the data, but the meaning of the data. So what advice and strategies do you have for effectively articulating and conveying that so what? Uh, Emilio? Yeah, yeah. Happy to jump into this topic. Um, so say what you think the company should do first say what you think the company should do so somebody who's working with a project update or a data analysis or a new model that they're working on in the machine learning space that's achieving amazing results the easiest and fastest way i have found to make an impression with that research or discovery is to articulate what you think the company should do with what you've discovered first. Something that I've learned through my executive speaking training is that oftentimes we have a storytelling approach to sharing a result or a recommendation. We start off with the problem statement, the methodology, how the research went, the result, and then the synthesis or recommendation for the result. That does not work as well in business, in my experience. Instead, what we really think about is the inverted triangle, where instead of starting with this long base of context moving up to the final recommendation, you start off with the recommendation and if necessary, move down to the details. This is something that can be very difficult for a business analyst or a director, director of analytics to do when presenting a recommendation to people. But what I'd advise you to do is think about what the recommendation is first and then focus on how the data give evidence for that recommendation later. Excellent. I mean, you just nailed what it takes to succeed with that type of audience is leading with the bottom line, which uh, to your point, and, uh, a lot of this comes from the way in which we're taught to write research, right? It's a very chronological process that you follow. However, not necessarily the right approach in business, leading with that bottom line, supporting with details is needed. Uh, Sarah, what would you add? Yeah, I think what we know from a neuroscience perspective is that if you don't give people context and you don't give people a reason that they want to attach to that personally, it doesn't mean anything. And so you can throw numbers at people all day, every day and say, you know, this is how this works in this context. But until they can find a reason that it resonates with them, it's not going to stay in their brain and it's not they're not going to remain hooked on whatever topic you're speaking to. So making sure that it's very clear again, you know, like Emilio said, the presentation is there, why you're presenting these numbers is there. And then I think really driving it home with some sort of anecdote or a reason why within an organization they would be using this is really helpful. And it, then it just, it really just sticks in the brain then, gives context, and then it gives them ample room to to call from that later. Excellent. Excellent. Um, John, let's talk about uh, some additional strategies for effectively netting out your message. Uh, Emilio, discussed some advice earlier in terms of the 1030 rule. What what additional advice do you have? There, there are a couple of things, particularly for if there are senior staff in the room, you need to let them know what the recommendation is clearly and concisely. Every executive we have interviewed has told us that. Get to the point quicker. One of them actually said a great line, it's not a murder mystery. So this is what we're recommending. And then Follow that immediately. How will that benefit the business? So particularly for a technical presenter, they not only need to know the what they're talking about, but the so what in terms of its impact 
on the decision makers, whoever they may be. There's one other tool that we often use to help somebody respond concisely to a question. We call it the PREP model, P-R-E-P. This is my position. And if you have a position, you always have it for a reason. That's the R. Give one compelling piece of evidence and then restate your position as a nice period at the end of this uh, of your thought. Uh, that concise model keeps things moving so that I don't go into a deep dive if that's not what is needed. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that, John. And I think that is a very, very powerful tool is having some sort of framework to, to craft that message, I think can be very, very um, helpful to those that where this just doesn't come naturally. It gives you kind of a formula to follow. Okay, so we've talked a lot about how you go about crafting your message, how you make sure it's uh, connected with a way that's going to be meaningful to your audience and the sequence. We haven't talked a lot about actual delivery, though, how you deliver that message in a way that's going to be compelling, engaging. And uh, this, I, I don't want to generalize, just in our experience, this is often a little uncomfortable for a lot of highly technical people. Does it necessarily come natural to them? So what advice do you have for learning how to have a more, learning how to and getting comfortable with having a more engaging delivery style? Um, Sarah, you started on the stage as an opera singer. So I, uh, believe you have some experience in this area, not to mention you've presented at a lot of conferences. So share some advice. Oh, I feel like I have an unfair advantage just simply because I have been presenting for so long. Um, you know, it's really about being engaging and telling a story. And the more passionate you are about what you're saying and the more you believe what you're saying, the more you're going to bring people along with you. Um, also making sure that that content is at the right level. My poor children get so much explanation about technology. And if I know that I can keep them engaged, then for me, that's a really great baseline that I'm going to be able to keep a conference audience engaged and really with me along the way. And there's just simple things like making sure that you're not speaking too quickly, take advantage of your pauses. And just really about the confidence. If you don't feel confident, it's one of those things you have to fake it because everyone's going to notice. But also what took me a really long time is that everyone in the audience, they really just want to see you succeed. I don't think I've been to a single conference where people just wanted to see you fall flat on your face. So know that people are there. They're supporting you. There's a reason you're on that stage as well. They're trying to give a message. There is a message that's coherent, that's um, beneficial to the audience that's in that room. So really, you know, go with that and make sure that it's there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, John, what would you add? Well, one, one of the things that a lot of the participants in our high-tech speaking class have told us they are self-described introverts. So speaking to their small team, relatively easy. Speaking to a customer group or at a conference setting, uh, they're pretty far outside of their comfort zone. So one of the things, besides the work I do with power speaking, I have also coached TED speakers. And they did a survey, I think two years ago, where they were asking the audience, if you're looking for a speaker who's confident, charismatic, and credible, what are the things you are looking for? And they named three. We want to hear a voice that's energetic, that conveys a message. I really believe what I'm talking about because as soon as my voice flattens out, the subliminal message is, I don't even sound like I believe it. So the first thing they highlighted was voice. The second were to use gestures in a way that were descriptive of the content. Because a lot of audiences, English is not their first language. So early when I mentioned snorkeling, not scuba diving, right away people have a visual image that supports the message. And the third thing they said in the TED research, when appropriate, smile. 
we like people who look like they're having a good time with what with what they're talking about. And I would add to that, if you're in a live audience, it's important not just to make eye contact, which can be too fast, where I move from person to person to person to person and don't really connect. So we teach a concept called eye interaction, which for a lot of people is much easier to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation for a sentence or two, take a breath, and then talk to somebody else. In the virtual environment, that for me is the greatest challenge that, that I face. Because right now I am looking at Sarah, but I'm not talking to Sarah. I'm talking to Sarah's picture. Oh, now I'm talking to Sarah. So in a virtual environment, my lens is surrounded by little smiley faces. As my reminder, the audience is in there, not down there. Those are a couple of tips I hope will help the people who have logged on for this call today. Excellent. Excellent. It's clear that you have decades of experience doing this, John. Very, I love just how tangible and actionable your advice is. And you reminded me very briefly of I was interviewing a candidate last week who never once looked at the camera. Mm. It, it was obvious that the Zoom session was on another monitor. So this is how uh, he was communicating his value. So it's important advice for a whole host of scenarios. And I see Mary McGlynn has dropped an exceptional resource in uh, chat for us, The Art and Science of Communicating Numbers. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Emilio, what, what would you add to this? I, I would add that there's a lot of attentional blindness in the business and technology world. And what I mean by attentional blindness is because of the lack of differentiation in how people speak and present, whether it's at a corporate conference, a keynote speak or a speech, or a boardroom presentation, people are used to the same kind of thing again and again and again. So it becomes increasingly difficult to pay attention to that. So an example is up out in front of me, behind me, you can see an office building. If I were to pay attention to this office building for a long period of time, no one window would stand out to me. But if somebody were waving a hand at me, I would start to pay attention to them. And I think that sort of metaphor helps me thinking about how I present in the boardroom in terms of coming up with a compelling, different presentation style. I want to be different than how everyone is doing it. I think today I present differently from Sarah and John, and that makes you more likely to remember me. Now in the software as a service space, which some of you may work in, you'll see that storytelling is a very popular way of communicating a technology for purchase. So you hear about Johnny the marketer waking up one day and checking to see what inbound leads he has and then passing it along to Sally the salesperson. And that sort of style feels really old to me. It's 10 years old. Almost every company does it. So something that I think about, and hopefully you can take with you to your own work, is to think about how to take those sorts of, those pieces of knowledge about how other people are presenting technically and doing something really different. So in my case, it's using inflection. It's starting off with the point in mind. It's maybe using humor. It's maybe not. It's being provocative in terms of what we suggest people do. But I think that one thing that's in common to what Sarah and John have suggested already is that something that people never get tired of is energy. Another thing that people never get tired of is preparation. Another thing that people never get tired of is a provocative, well thought point of view. And those are things that I always encourage you to bring to your presentations, no matter how small they are. Now, the second thing that I want to recommend is around preparation. The Beatles, before they got signed, played 626 live shows. And when I think about that, I think about the ways that we as technical professionals can prepare before we present. I mean, it's kind of funny if you think about the fact that we'll spend 800 hours on a technical project, but eight minutes on the presentation preparation. It's weird, right? And it represents a massive distortion in how we can value our time in preparing for ultimately a presentation that could change our careers 
our companies and our clients' lives. And so something that I really encourage everybody to do here is just practice a lot. Something that I didn't mention earlier on is I'm also a musician. Actually, I went to music school first. And I think something that musicians do really well is we're used to this idea of practicing in isolation by ourselves for hours and hours and hours. So the notion of preparing for a presentation is not something that's arduous or a surprise to us. It's something that musicians are very, very used to. So again, something that I encourage you to do is to practice. Practice a lot. And something that I'll tell, I'll tell the story of really quickly is how when I took the power speaking class, I absolutely cringed when Carrie had to go through a video recording of me presenting to the audience. And something that they do in class that Carrie didn't mention on this is that they'll record you giving a speech for two minutes and then they'll take you aside and give you feedback and point out what you're doing in the presentation. Now that's really cringe to, for everybody to deal with, but it's one of the pathways to getting way, way better at this skill. So again, don't be afraid to differentiate. Don't be afraid to bring energy in a provocative point of view, but most importantly, don't be afraid to be like the Beatles and play those 626 shows before you finally get that record deal. And now, did they ever, did they ever record your, um, your courses or any of your concerts that you did? And then make yeah, sure. Yeah. We had to we had to record every single week our our lesson, mm -hmm. and every single week we had to come back and say this is what we didn't do right. This is what needs to be better. Um, and for those of you who listen to public speakers and are coaching some public speakers or have people in your organization who are speaking, that feedback is invaluable. You don't have to be mean about it. You don't have to be overly critical, but just saying, hey, these are the things that you did really really well. Focus on these two things for the next time. And for me, even as somebody who continuously does this, and I think all of June and May, I was just did nothing but conferences, it's still really helpful to me as somebody who does this often. And for the people that I mentor as well, one of the things that they really like is when they get that feedback, because it really does help them up level and understand what's good, what could go better just across the board. Absolutely, Sarah. Yeah, just a few things I'd love to add, and then we're going to close with your parting advice. Uh, uh, I, I really appreciated that you talked about leading with what really works. And Emilio, hopefully you can attest to that when we reviewed your uh, playback, because there was a lot there that worked. Uh, because we want to lean into our strengths, the things that we naturally do well. And then as it relates to upgrades, especially for those of you where voice modulation, pause, uh, descriptive gestures, et cetera, might not come naturally. Remember, it can be incremental. It can be incremental improvement. But like golf, you know, focus on one or two things at a time and you can keep getting better and better. Just the last thing I'll add, it couldn't be easier than ever in this virtual world in which we operate. You're on recorded sessions all the time. So it doesn't even have to be a formal presentation. You might want to play back, but you might want to play back how you interacted within a meeting. How are you showing up? And you'll quickly see some blind spots and opportunities for that incremental improvement. Okay. Uh, Can I make one comment really quick? James is saying that uh, to take feedback, it's hard to be humble, but important to truly listen. Yes, absolutely. And also one of the things that I do my best to to fulfill and also ask the people that I'm giving feedback to is not to respond in any way, shape, or form when I give them the feedback. So to that extent, sometimes I'll give it to them written and say, hey, sit on this for 24 hours, see what you think, then we're going to come back and discuss it because it gives time for it to set in and it dissipates that idea of fight or flight so that there doesn't feel like there needs to be a reaction and it doesn't feel like it's confrontational. And that really seems to help people take that next step. Great. E excellent. Uh, we have a question from Sarah, and then we'll we'll close it up. Uh, Sarah says, um, has, has the group got any advice on sharing tech info in a way that doesn't dumb it down for the technical people in the audience, but also is not too techy for those in the audience who are from the business side? Great question. Um, I'll give my take on this. I'll give my take. Okay. Um, it's an impossible problem. 
there is no way to do that. That's my belief. And, and I, I welcome dissenting views, but I've never seen a successful example of talking about SIP trunks and telephony to uh, a CFO. And there are ways to connect the dots, but when you require a certain level of technical depth that you can't obfuscate through business value, I think the skill requisite to be successful in communicating is to book another meeting and discuss that in a separate sphere. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would, I would tend to agree that at a certain point there comes just a differentiation between what the actual outcome of that conversation needs to be and what the value is of that conversation. So if it's something that has to go super, super in depth in terms of tech, then that might be a different conversation. If it's something that falls in my lap, typically what I'll try to do is make sure that there's a conversation going on business value for technical people and technical for business people so that you have sort of the same chunk and the same alignment throughout the entire conversation. But everybody walks away with some sort of value coming out of that conversation. So maybe not so much leaning on the technical in those conversations, but learning or understanding what might be missing a little bit to close that gap between these conversations so that we can start moving into those more technical conversations and moving up to the more business value conversations. Okay. All right. So I'm going to um, challenge you, Emilio. It's not impossible because you offered a recommendation. I mean, it might be that you just acknowledge, given the objective for today's discussion, we're not going to be able to go to that level of depth. However, let's have a whatever the case might be. Uh, so we've got, I, I, I keep... Mary, um, I, just before you wrap yeah. up, I wanted to add two things that tie what, what Emilio mentioned. When he mentioned the CFO, he also a couple of times used the word metaphors. I am really big on that. And one of the things we ask people in our classes, what is a hobby or interest you have outside of work or family? And I know our colleague Ralph Walters on the call, and he will remember the time we were working with a Salesforce group in Switzerland, and we were working with a young woman who had to convince the CFOs of companies that were newly acquired to use the Salesforce system. And she was getting a lot of pushback. So when I asked her, well, what's the connection between your hobby, which is tennis, and getting this message across? And her initial reaction was, there is no connection. Ralph and I, by this point, knew enough to be silent. And all of a sudden, the light came on in her eyes. She said, I've got it. You can't play tennis with a bowling ball. <laughs> and what she was conveying was, it's not that your system is wrong. It's just more cumbersome. And we're going to show you a smaller, more agile system. And a year later, we ran into her in the hallway. She said when she started using that metaphor, the resistance dropped dramatically. Mm, mm. Great. And I see uh, Ralph came off uh, video to to just really lean into that. <laughs> and you're getting yeah. a thumbs up. Right. All right. We, unfortunately, do not have time to address all the questions in chat. Thank you, Sarah, for putting something there. Do know that we always follow up these episodes with a blog in which we go in more detail. So um, stay tuned for that. And as I mentioned at the outset, this will be available for you in a podcast version. So let's bring this home. And Sarah, what parting advice would you like to leave your audience with? Parting advice. Um, I'd say there's been a lot of amazing information and advice given today. And I, I myself have walked away richer knowledge for it um, and the different ways that both John and Emilio address this. The best way to figure out what works for you and how you do this and how do you go about doing this in practice is just do it. And, you know, don't worry so much about what people are going to think about you. We all started somewhere. I promise you can find some of my beginning stuff on YouTube. It's not great. Um, but it's it's a growing thing. And it's about how do you work and make yourself a vessel for the message that you want to deliver at the end of the day and what is the best process for you moving that forward. Beautifully said stretch yourself. John, what about you? Well, n now knowing that both Sarah has an opera background and Emilio a musical background, I don't know anybody in any field 
who's good, who hasn't gotten coaching. So if this is a skill you want to get better at, doing it by yourself is arduous. Getting a good coach, and this is a shameless plug for power speaking because we are really good at this, helping anybody get and improve the skills they need to move to the next level. And when you're rehearsing by yourself on your smartphone or whatever video platform you're using, don't rehearse an entire talk. Rehearse a segment of it Play the video back. Do you sound energetic? Are you looking at the camera? You can become your own coach as well as going to others who can provide you with that kind of feedback. Excellent advice. Emilio, bring us home. Yeah, I think you want to have fun with it. And part of having fun is not doubling down on what makes you unique, but tripling down on what makes you unique. So if you have a certain skill or aptitude or way of speaking or way of gesturing, right, um, take advantage of that and develop your own signature way of presenting. I think the last thing that I'll say, too, is for the technical people in the audience, you have no problem studying 200 hours for a certification, but take an eight-hour public speaking class. The dividends that it will pay for your career will blow your mind. And I am an evangelist for the idea of investing in coaching. I still do bi-weekly coaching anytime I have an important call internally or externally, and it has made a material difference to my career growth and trajectory. I am floored by how few people do that in Silicon Valley where I live and how few people do that outside of the C room. So I think in your particular example, you've already taken the first step to investing and developing the skill today, but don't stop. And when you have to choose between studying for the cloud practitioner certification or taking an executive speaking class, I strongly encourage you to think about the decision of investing in your presentation skills. Oh, wow. What a way to end. Couldn't agree more strongly. Thank you so much. This has been a, a incredibly useful conversation. Thank you to your to our audience for your engagement. And we'll close by briefly sharing with you the topic we're going to be covering next month, which is all around enhancing your interviewing skills, starting with looking at the camera. Thank you again. Oh, 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 oh,